Um, we wrote this book because we were excited by what has felt like in the past year a real shift in climate politics. Um, so the sort of sequence of uh, last October, the IPCC report um, that came out and said, you know, we have 12 years to substantially reduce carbon emissions uh, to avoid 1.5 degrees of warming, um, that being the, uh, the level of warming that both scientists and activists have agreed is what we should stick to um, or, or stay below. Uh, followed by um, AOC being elected to Congress in November and immediately saying that a Green New Deal was going to be one of her priorities. Um, the Sunrise sit ins uh, on, on Capitol Hill, um, Washington, uh, DC, sorry, <laughs> um, and Nancy Pelosi's office, uh, and then the, the Green New Deal resolution in February um, that, uh, that, that Ocasio Cortez and Ed Markey put out, um, which we were really, I think, struck by because I've uh, um, so Kate and, and Daniel and Thea and I have all been following politics in different ways for many years um, and had been, uh, you know, have seen a lot of, of climate policy that does not feel like it really is rising to the level of the threat we face and that isn't, um, uh, that's not on the level of sort of ambition that we need. And so it was exciting to see um, in, the, in the resolution that came out uh, a, a program that I think recognized that climate change is, um, uh, requires really substantial changes to our society and our economy, that recognizes that climate change is not a problem um, that can be addressed uh, separate from other problems, that it's connected to um, questions of, of how we live, how we work, uh, how we get around, all of these other things that are sometimes treated as social problems. Um, but it was a, you know, it was obviously a sort of um, relatively, uh, you know, it was a short resolution. It didn't have a lot of detail, and so a lot of the conversation well, was, well, a lot of people have signed on to this. Everyone's saying a Green New Deal sounds like a good idea, but what is it exactly? Um, uh, and that was the one response, and the other was sort of, well, uh, why is all of these? Why are all these social programs um, attached to the Green New Deal? Uh, why are all these these sort of social programs attached to climate policy? Shouldn't climate policy be more specific and more focused? Um, why is, uh, as it was sometimes called, the socialist wish list thrown in there? And so, what we wanted to do was essentially both flesh out what we thought, um, what. Uh, could and should be part of a Green New Deal and what could and should be part of a, a climate program, but also to make the case um, for why we think uh, why we think a lot of those programs deserve to be part of, of climate action. And, and the argument is, um, as Philip said, all climate or all politics is climate politics, but also that uh, what we say a radical Green New Deal is an effective Green New Deal. And what we mean by that is that uh, we need to have climate policy that really um, that is both getting at the root of the problem, um, not radical as in marginal, radical as in addressing uh, the root of, of the problem of climate change, which again is not something that we can separate out and say it's just about energy um, and that you can just replace uh, fossil fuels with renewable energy. Actually, we have to rethink a lot of um, uh, the ways that fossil fuels are built into um, our everyday lives, and that means and that means some, some more substantial changes, but also that we can't do that in a way that's just, uh, we can't, do climate policy in a way that's that's um, trying to sort of sneak it past people, where it's uh, it's something that nobody's supposed to pay attention to, that you don't have to build popular support for, and that you don't have to um, that people don't um, see something that's that's going to benefit them in their lives. Uh, so we we think that to have climate policy that will be effective, you actually have to you have to build um, that kind of mass popular support, and that means thinking about how um, uh, action to reduce carbon emissions and to decarbonize isn't just a sacrifice that you make for the benefit of the future or for the benefit um, of, uh, you know, sort of the climate or the environment in the abstract, but actually that there are real tangible benefits um, in the present for most people. And so we wanted to think about what that would mean, what that would look like, and, and try to articulate what that would be in a few um, core areas of, of um, you know, our society and our economy. Well, I think the book does a great job in making the case that uh, both of the components, the social component and the, uh, uh, the ecological component, energize each other, where when they're pursued separately, they can get reduced down to very sort of uh, 
technical wonky uh, elements, uh, you know, or, or even something silly like change your light bulbs occasionally. Uh, whereas, uh, so, so you make the case that what people are claiming is the, the uh, liability of the Green New Deal approach is actually its greatest strength in its ability to galvanize and mobilize people to become part of a society-wide mission. Uh, let me just uh, take you through a, a scenario at the beginning of the book, which uh, uh, I found quite engaging, was uh, set in New Orleans in 2027. Uh, tell us what happens and the kind of response and what's going on at the same time. Yeah, so we open the book with a sort of imagined future scenario. Um, that's what we, uh, a, a storm that we call Maggie, uh, but that is sort of a Katrina too, um, that, uh, you know, a, a category four storm that hits New Orleans um, and imagining what that, what that looks like, but with the argument being that um, rather than having the kind of uh, devastation that that occurred in New Orleans uh, in 2005, that where you know 2,000 people died, um, the city was really devastated. That actually, it's possible to imagine both that we will be um, facing uh, what we know are likely to be intensifying disasters, um, more extreme weather, all of these kinds of things that that um, that we know are are coming. Uh, but that doesn't have to mean the same kinds of social effects. And so we try to think through what could this look like if you actually had, um, and we imagine a scenario where you know people are evacuated. They uh, are have a place to stay when they're evacuated, but also there are rebuilding crews that are ready to, to come in and sort of um, uh, to, to restore community life afterwards where there's, um, you know, the, that the storm itself occasions a new set of protests where people say, look, we really need, this is evidence that we really need to be um, acting to decarbonize more and faster. We need to be making more investments in marginalized communities who are at the most risk for climate change, uh, the effects of climate change, um, where you have a lot of, um, that the, these kinds of uh, disasters and crises are coming, but we, we can imagine that kind of climatological effects paired with a political and social response um, that's, that's, you know, averting the worst kinds of uh, harms while also using, uh, seeing those as moments where we need to press for more, um, more action to, to stave off those in the future. So that these kinds of crises we need to think about as moments um, where we need to continue to press for, uh, for more climate action. Yeah, and, and what struck me was it wasn't a, a utopian or a dystopian picture. It, there was a higher level of disaster, but there's also a higher level of response. And there was a kind of a dialectical relations, if I can use that. Uh, left word here between other things that are going on in society. There are people chaining themselves to bulldozers in Wyoming. There are climate strikes going on. There's a Chinese relief team that comes to New Orleans to help out. I mean, it, it seemed like a plausible world to me. Um, you focus uh, the book mostly on what you call the pivotal 2020s, the short term rather, rather than the long term. Why did you pick that focus particularly? Um, so we so we're trying to outline a set of things that we think can happen in the short term um, and that we can start fighting for and winning right now because um, as we know we really need to be uh, decarbonizing as quickly as possible we need to start um, we don't want to set there have been I think too long uh, we feel that that the targets for climate uh, for decarbonizing have been you know 2050 have been off in the distance um, and that's that's the kind of timeline where by the time you get there, um, the people who made that commitment are, you know, no longer in office or they're uh, no longer in power, they're no longer, um, you know, responsible or accountable. And so we, um, that I think has been a problem for a lot of climate policy, but also we just really want to be thinking, okay, um, again, this isn't a problem of, of the distant future, it's a problem of, of right now and how can we be thinking about programs that will be um, delivering uh, real benefits to people in the present that can galvanize uh, new uh, new action to to continue pressing. And so we, throughout the book, try to think of how to create virtuous cycles of policies. So um, things where you can, you know, make a demand for uh, a green new deal for housing, and um, when say, uh, you know, this one of our co-authors, Daniel Donna Cohen, was recently helped write this bill that um, Bernie Sanders and AOC just put uh, before Congress, uh, Green New Deal for Housing, that would invest uh, in, in retrofitting public housing units. Um, and that when you have things like that, you can, that's 
a first step and then you can build on that and, and continue to build and have a virtuous cycle towards more and more climate action um, happening uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, um, I, you wrote about the original New Deal that uh, it excelled in creating a positive feedback loop between public spending on collective goods and mass mobilization, thus overcoming anti-socialist hostility from the business class and political elites. Uh, the New Deal has been under attack for a while, both from the right and the left. Uh, the left rightly pointing out its limitations, the deals that were made with essentially Democrats in the South to uh, uh, keep the Jim Crow situation in place and who wasn't included from the right, uh, various kind of economic critiques and so forth. But I think uh, uh, your choice to make it a touchstone uh, and uh, your reasons for doing so are, uh, are quite interesting. What can we learn from the New Deal and how did it create a constituency of Democrats for life? Yeah. So the Green New Deal is uh, probably not the phrase I would have chosen actually <laughs> to name this kind of climate policy, but that's what we got. And so at some point it's like, all right, well, we're calling it the Green New Deal. Let's go with it. What I do think is, um, you know, the, the reason I, I don't, I wouldn't probably pick the Green New Deal as a phrase because it both, I think, suggests a kind of nostalgia that we just need to go back and, you know, kind of do the 20th century over again. And that also suggests that the, the New Deal didn't have many of the problems that we know it had. Um, particularly around uh, the compromises made with other Democrats that in many ways entrenched systems of racial segregation um, that often, uh, you know, you know, excluded uh, certain kinds of workers from protections and so on. So there are a lot of problems with the New Deal, but what we do find, I think, inspirational about it or uh, worth taking from it are a couple of things. And one is um, the, the, you know, the fact that it did deliver a lot of, um, for its many, you know, it had many problems, but it also did create a new sort of set of social obligations, um, a new set of, of uh, commitments by the state to um, for forms of public provision, for forms of public welfare uh, that people then could um, saw materialize in their actual lives uh, in the forms of access to work, of access to relief, of access to, to things that they needed to, um, you know, to, to have a better life and that that, um, and that seeing that and seeing what the state could do for people in their daily lives made people, um, you know, want to defend those things uh, and to to uh, have those things in an ongoing way. And so that there was a real, um, that it really did create a, a set of people who saw what, um, you know, the Democratic Party had basically delivered for them and uh, then kind of, you know, as, you know, in the phrase made, made people Democrats for life, made people continue to support that party that had delivered those things. So we think we need to have something that's, um, you know, that, that delivers that kind of benefit. Um, the other thing is I think the thing in the New Deal as a real era, um, so it's not like, we don't think of the New Deal as like a policy or a single piece of legislation. It is a new, um, it's a, you know, it's a period of, of several decades um, that, that really represented a, a significant shift in the relationship between state and economy um, and, and as I was saying sort of what the expectations of the state and of the public sector were and of what kinds of public goods people could expect from it and that that um, was a real transformation and sort of um, in the entire social order that lasted for a long period of time and I think that's what we are arguing we need now is we need to not just have think of the Green New Deal as like one bill or one resolution or one set of legislation, but rather as a new, um, you know, a, a, a multi-decade project of remaking American life and society and economy um, and, in, and remaking that relationship of politics and economics um, and of the state and the economy. So, uh, you, you mentioned that the, one of the challenges is making green investment viscerally popular. And... Uh, we might even also say collective action because you're looking at 40 years of what we might call unraveling of America under neoliberalism. Everybody has been encouraged to uh, think of themselves as bits of human capital that they can invest uh, individually here or there and their own future will be entirely the result of uh, what they do rather than what they do with other people. One would think that such a social Darwinist view would be uh, have no effective stickiness on people and yet as Foucault establishes very well there's something about this uh, 
view that even though it doesn't keep not keeps not delivering the view sticks together and you think oh, but tomorrow I'll take some more courses and I'll, I'll get more skills and things will work out it, it, this is uh, we don't have those years of union struggle behind us where people saw a lot of people saw what collective action could deliver how do we meet that challenge now yeah it's a I mean it's a really I think it's a really big challenge to um, uh, as, as you're saying <laughs> reverse 40 years of sort of of the of the erosion of the New Deal project or not erosion the act of dismantling of the New Deal project and of the forms of collective action that that built it um, particularly uh, the forms of collective labor action and, and unionization but um, other kinds of sort of collective life as well so it is going to be, I think, a really a, a major challenge, but I think it's really crucial. And part of the reason is uh, because I think it's particularly important around climate. Well, maybe not particularly important, <laughs> but is is it maybe particularly particularly salient, or you can really see that kind of um, individualization uh, in climate politics in the way that it's often discussed as sort of a thing that we all should. Um, that the the way we can we can try to do something about climate is like what can I do? How can I you know should I eat less meat? Should I fly less? Should I you know have children? There's all these sort of individualized choices that people talk about as the way to um, you know the, what you can do. But really, what we're arguing is that we we need to change collectively. Um, we uh, sort of patterns of consumption uh, and production are things that are that are beyond any one individual person, um, and that to actually address uh, you. You know, our you know our, our carbon footprints. That's not an individual level kind of thing. Those are about um, what kinds of about the structure of um, not even our society, society, but our, our built environments of, of the world that <laughs> that we just live in. Um, about infrastructure, about things that we we can't individually change. And so you could say, well. I'll um, you can only take uh, an electric bus to work if there's an electric bus to take, <laughs> and if there's not, then maybe you have to drive or, or whatever it may be. And we really have to think about uh, individual choices, but as collective choices about, um, uh, you know, the the structure of our world. And so to do that, that also means that we need to act collectively around how to remake those. And so um, we talk about different ways that I think that that kind of uh, that those those things can be made tangible um, everywhere. Everything from uh, how, how, what you know, look like today, um, what 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 the span of sort of green jobs are, and how we can have those be real things that um, you know people can have access to good work, um, and and also treat that as a form of collective action. But also things like housing, about um, things like transportation, uh, things like public abundance and public forms of leisure and luxury. Um, so it's not that nobody should consume anything and we should all be really um, aesthetic and uh, you know, um, live lives of, of sacrifice, but we can have forms of public, um, public consumption that are luxurious but also lower resource intensity. So, um, so we're trying to think about ways that, that our lives actually can be um, viscerally better um, in real ways uh, and, and that that hopefully can continue to build a new constituencies for more action in, uh, down the road. It's interesting that the tech industry is conceiving of our future as the future of individuals, self-driving cars. Everything is geared to trying to isolate people and deliver what they think the person as a customer would want. Uh, and that, that too is something that needs to be overcome, I guess, since people uh, have located uh, our technological capacity, our capacity to invent a future, and people who are only inventing one kind of future. You know, so how, how to, how to uh, diminish their mystique is another uh, challenge that I hope the Green New Deal will deliver. Yeah. Um, let's, let's talk about how do we approach working class communities uh, built around extractive in industries that see their own livelihoods disappearing. How, do, how can we ensure them that it will be a justice-based transition that will take care of them and provide for them something that is interesting to do in a more, that is, uh, uh, in a more secure way than clinging to something that, is, that has a sell-by date on it and is going to disappear? Yeah, so we talk a lot about, um, uh, you know, sort of the politics of, of labor and climate and, um, you know, the jobs environment question or the sort of... Um, you know the 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 posing 
you can, you know, jobs versus environment has been the framework for a lot of environmental politics for the past, um, I would say, at least 40 years or so. And it's, uh, it's been, unfortunately, I think, very effective in part because, um, you know, the right will say on the one hand, um, environmental regulations will destroy jobs and kill jobs. Uh, and then um, even as with, you know, with the other hand, they're often um, uh, undermining worker rights and, uh, and worker protections and making work worse in many ways. So it's, I think, a disingenuous <laughs> kind of um, uh, uh, warning. But nevertheless, it's been effective because the more insecure work gets, the worse the conditions of work get, um, the harder it is to organize and, to, um, and the more uh, precarious workers are. And so the more um, having a job that pays well um, is something you don't want to lose. And so I think that's made it really difficult to, to figure out how to get past the kind of labor um, uh, and climate problem, but so we we try to take I think a couple of different tacks on that, and one is um, drawing on the history of the just transition, um, the idea of the just transition, which is develops out of um, labor, out of the labor movement, and out of um, people in the labor movement trying to think through well, what do you do say um, uh, in in the face of something like nuclear disarmament? How can you make sure that uh, workers who are um, you know atomic workers can uh, have uh, have livelihoods even after we dismantle um, an industry that's you know that's uh, harmful and and something that we should that's like not good for society. Um, how can we make sure that workers who are working in industries uh, in chemical industries that are um, often very harmful to their own health uh, can can um, have an alternative form of work? And so we take I think both inspiration from that and think that we you know we we support calls for the just transition. But what that means I think is that we have to have a more robust set of expectations around what um, a, a sort of climate jobs program is. Because I think if you look at something like the um, you know climate policy uh, in the Obama era, it was mostly I mean they used the language of green jobs. Um, and uh, even the language of the Green New Deal, but the Green Jobs Program there was essentially just uh, job retraining um, and a little bit of money for uh, you know incentives for job creators. But it wasn't um, you know the kinds of like major public works programs that would actually create jobs. Uh, nothing like um, or or uh, any kind of commitment to actually creating jobs for workers who were going to lose their jobs. So you know job retraining is pretty paltry um, if you're facing the loss of your job. And I think. Uh, you know, workers are, I think, right to be suspicious of something like that. So we're saying, you know, we need to actually be um, investing in the kinds of public works projects that would create jobs. And we also talk about the job guarantee, which is the idea that the government guarantees a job to anyone who would want one. And I think the guarantee is important for saying, you know, this is uh, something that will be there. Um, that, that, you know, climate action is going to be tumultuous. That's something that is remaking society in the level that we're talking about will be a kind of tumultuous project, but that we need to be committing to um, not leaving people behind through that. So we talk about that as a sort of specific, concrete uh, idea. It, it will be tumultuous or it will not be. Yeah, yeah. I, what I really liked um, about the combination of the political and the uh, climatological is uh, the notion of how to overcome the entrenched anti-democratic mechanisms of American liberal institutions. There isn't one single democratic institution that really functions to reflect the will of the people, whether it's the Senate, the Supreme Court, or so forth, electoral college, filibuster. There are all of these things that are put to essentially, which were originally thought of, uh, purpose was to refine democracy, but came, uh, became something that literally put it in chains. So particularly if all the politics has taken place in, the, in, in getting people in the Supreme Court, so they can literally check uh, any kind of popular initiative. Uh, but people are not interested directly in dealing with institutional reform, but the notion of uh, picking something that they desire very much to have and pursue and keep follow, finding these institutions in their path could lead to these institutions being overloaded and destroying being destroyed of themselves because it becomes more and more obvious that they simply don't serve the people in any way. Uh, yeah, so we don't go into tons of detail on institutional reform, but I think it's clear that um, any kind of major uh, project like this would face a lot of resistance both. Um, you know, I think there are, there are really clear challenges to over 
for any kind of really uh, major political change at the moment um, because uh, and for, for many reasons, but including the, the undemocratic nature of, of institutions like the Senate, the Electoral College, um, the Supreme Court. Uh, but we think that the way that you, you know, there's, again, um, the way to, to get through that isn't to sort of try to just uh, make a deal um, with, you know, sort of the reach across the aisle, make a deal uh, and, and try, to, try to get through what you can because, I mean, A, that really has not worked <laughs> when it comes to climate policy um, and there's been a lot of failures of supposedly bipartisan climate policy, um, including even the sort of really basic carbon tax kind of idea that, uh, that, that it's been almost impossible to get any Republicans to support. Um, but also that we really need to, um, the, the way to, to get more uh, ambitious and aggressive climate action through is, is not to um, try to, to, again, sneak it through, through. And I think this is sort of that, the rationale behind something like Obama's Clean Power Plan, um, which was a, an attempt to use executive action um, to do what legislative action couldn't. And we just think that the way that you, um, the way you get past it is you have to build the, the again, mass popular support for programs um, that, that can um, push things through in instances, uh, that can put pressure on institutions to respond to what is, uh, to that kind of, you know, what's coming as a grassroots mobilization in forms, which is why we need to think about how we can build um, that kind of uh, popular support rather than just trying to, um, yeah, like work, or do a workaround that will eventually be overturned, that if you have a new administration will uh, will we'll get thrown out, um, that will be blocked by the Supreme Court and so on. So there's no way, there's no way around you have to go through. I'll just do one more question and then we'll uh, take it out of the audience. You, uh, you talk about a faux new deal, a faux new deal as the kind of uh, uh, shadowy stalker of the real Green New Deal. Uh, uh, Jeff Mann has a a, a book called Climate Leviathan, uh, where he tries to imagine the political uh, political theory of climate change, uh, uh, which in his book is coming, and one has to kind of adjust to the differential mobilities of populations all over the world, and try to figure out how one can uh, uh, construct in those circumstances a politics that deals with the needs of the many rather than the few. And one of his visions is what he calls climate leviathan, borrowing from Thomas Hobbes. It's almost like it's a lifeboat where only the elite get on, but it's, uh, the, the lifeboat is embraced in the name of saving the planet. And the particularly dangerous thing about that vision is that all the scientists who are on the side of uh, of our side at the moment by pointing out that climate change is happening, uh, which gives us a huge boost, uh, yet could divide into some supporting this notion in order to save the planet of having the liberal elites uh, get into the lifeboat and everybody else consigned outside of Elysium in, in the splinter lands around the world. Uh, so how do you, how do you, uh, how do you relate to Jeff's vision and, uh, and how do you challenge that or avoid it? Yeah, um, I love Jeff Mann's book, uh, Climate Leviathan. It's really brilliant if anyone's really interested in climate uh, and political theory. It's, uh, it's a really good book. Um, we don't address it directly, but we're definitely, I think, um, in this, this idea of the faux Green New Deal, I think, corresponds a lot to, to some of the visions that, that Jeff um, and his co-author Joel write about in terms of um, what, we, what we call the faux Green New Deal uh, in the book um, is essentially the, the version of the Green New Deal that is, um, because, the, the, you know, there have been a lot of versions of, of the Green New Deal and people have used that language to describe a lot of different programs. And so what we see as the faux Green New Deal is a sort of um, a set of programs that uh, would be, that's relatively minimal, that's focused on, um, you know, just sort of relatively narrow energy transition. And that's trying to avoid, um, I would say, sort of the, the political, um, avoid political aspects rather than taking them head on in a lot of ways. So we would see that as being, you know, I think what we've really, what most climate policy has been up until now. So like a carbon tax, a little bit of money for R&D, um, maybe some uh, funding for um, uh, some kinds of green infrastructure, but mostly um, keeping it relatively narrow and not, again, adding in all of these social programs. And so again, we say, 
Um, and that and that the argument for that is basically that it's it's too much to take on all of this other stuff that all of this other stuff is a distraction from the real climate program and a distraction from the real green energy program and so again our argument against the faux green deal is that there's not um i think it's one that there's uh that there's not um i think it's one that it's it's not enough it's not going to work uh and second that it doesn't have um, there's no constituency for it. There's no real support for that kind of program, and we need, again, um, to, to take the kinds of, uh, of climate action we need. We need to have a real constituency, people who are out and ready to fight for it and to keep fighting for it um, for a long time to come. So we want to avoid, uh, you know, we, we think it's important to say, like, this is not the solution. Um, and this, this program, which I think I think Jeff would probably call uh, the faux Green New Deal something like Climate Leviathon, right. and so they correspond in that way. Um, right. And so we we think we need something uh, pretty substantially different. Why don't we take some questions, Doug? <laughs> I'm wondering. Um, so I think if I if I understand your question, I think um, we would say that we need to be both building. Uh, thinking about policies that can speak to concerns that people already have and that are speaking to um, movements that already exist. So, for example, this uh, I mentioned this Green New Deal for Housing Bill, which is the first real Green New Deal piece of legislation that's come out and um, was just released a few days ago. And that uh, uh, that bill, which again proposes to put a lot of money into retrofitting public housing so it's energy efficient, um, so that people have uh, you know energy efficient appliances and and lower energy costs, is a response to um, and comes out of organizing um, from people from. Uh, housing movements um, from people who are facing, you know, high uh, energy bills from sort of concerns over the cost of both housing and uh, and energy, and so, and I think that that's a, an important thing to be thinking, or that's instructive as a sort of, um, you know, sort of first step, where it's a it's a piece of legislation that comes out of movements that's developed in conjunction with movements that. Uh, if it were to, to pass, would deliver some immediate kinds of benefits for people who are in those movements, and that can, then can kind of continue to build um, uh, or make it possible for people to take next steps that delivers like a real victory and a, and a win on something. Um, and that we would think, you know, I think housing, we talk a lot about housing in the book because both because housing uh, and uh, is a major source of carbon emissions, uh, and also because there's a housing crisis in a huge amount of the country. Um, I'm sure people here are familiar with um, that problem, the really <laughs> incredible, um, uh, the unaffordability of housing, and particularly housing in, in places that are, um, you know, all of the things that, that people say are good for the climate, like dense and walkable and, and all the uh, close to public transportation and so on. And those places are not affordable for, for many people to live in, um, and particularly working class people to live in. And so, we need to be thinking about how um, you know the kinds of uh, those kinds of social crises and the movements that are responding to them um, can be built into and part of uh, the kinds of policy solutions we're putting forward, and that those can be part of building. So I'm I'm not sure if that's quite what you're getting at. Yeah, I think we totally agree on that. So I think it's very much a vision that's um, meant to be part of an organizing project and an organizing project that can be. Um, that can build on itself and and that brings new people into the movement by virtue of of, of sort of organizing around demands that um, but also sort of hoping to win victories that can continue to feel more organizing so i think we probably agree on that well he reached across the aisle to find a consensus while attacking programs on the left as being unrealistic and visionary and so forth as he's doing now in the campaign but one would think, as uh, there's a nice quote in the book from Brad DeLong, who was part of the Clinton uh, centrist De Democratic Leadership Committee, uh, which uh, formulated a strategy that will try to reach over to Republicans in the center and get consensus about things we would like and sort of uh, abandon labor and so forth. And suddenly one discovers that uh, everything just kept moving to the right, uh, and, and the strategy didn't change. So if there is any strategy that's unrealistic, it's the notion that there is some sort of uh, consensual discussion of, uh, possible uh, w with the other side. Uh, the notion, I think, is, is wielding power at the moment. Uh, I, I like the way when you, you also say that when people talk about they don't have the political will to do something, that's, that's a very vague phrase, which means they don't have the political power. So the point is to get the power to be able to do it and wield it. 
Other questions? Yeah, so the international question is a really important one, and one of the chapters of the book is about um, how to think about uh, the international, um, because obviously climate change is a global problem, and it's not something that you can solve um, in one country alone. So um, even though we do think that the U.S. has particular, um, has historical responsibility in terms of um, really high uh, levels of historical carbon emissions, um, and in terms of being one of the major obstacles to reaching international agreement um, around uh, uh, or blocking international agreements to reduce carbon emissions. So there are specific things that we think the U.S. and we do think it matters what the U.S. does, but it's of course the U.S. can't solve this problem alone. And so although the, pro the program or, you know, the, the Green New Deal is a, is a sort of domestic program and, and it's focused for the most part on the U.S., um, we also argue that we, we of course need to think about new ways to approach the international question. And um, we try to argue, uh, you know, that the even a domestic program is never um, entirely domestic or the international is always present in the domestic um, and, and in particular that we need to be thinking about how a domestic Green New Deal is always connected to the rest of the world, um, not only in terms of sort of our, our carbon emissions but in terms of um, the supply chains and the sort of resources that go into making, uh, you know, green technology into making the sort of um, the, that go into making a Green New Deal um, in the United States. So. Um, we argue for for thinking about um, you know where things like the lithium that goes into uh, electric uh, the batteries of electric vehicles comes from and how that actually is a different way of thinking about um, international the international uh, piece of, of climate politics and so rather than um, you know international climate politics have typically just been like international negotiations at the UN, they happen once a year, it's, you have elite negotiators who um, reach some kind of deal that they probably don't expect to actually be held to, uh, you have protesters protesting, <laughs> um, and then nothing, uh, but, but rarely do you have sort of um, effective agreements come out of that. Uh, where you do see effective international um, agreements happening is uh, when it comes to things like global trade. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, tr international trade agreements um, uh, are enforced, um, are, uh, do have material effects in the world. And so we say, well, we should go and see, um, we should go to this, uh, look at those um, and see where climate is, uh, is, is uh, intersecting with, uh, you know, the global economy because we also know that that climate change is being fueled by um, uh, by the global economy, and so we have to think about where is where is sort of um, you know following the money in some way. And so we try to we try to look um, as I was saying at the at the supply chains of the Green New Deal. And so we have uh, uh, my co-author Theory of Franco's has done a lot of research on um, uh, lithium mining in Chile, and so she we look at um, the sort of dynamics of of uh, uh, lithium mining there, uh, both for the sort of um, who is people who are working in lithium mines, indigenous communities that uh, are, um, you know, live in the areas uh, where lithium is being mined uh, and the kinds of politics that are happening on the ground there and try to think about how that is uh, sort of a concrete place to build, um, you know, politics from, you know, from Chile to uh, the places where we're maybe um, building either electric vehicles in the U.S. or building infrastructure that that relies on that. So we and we are, we argue we need to be thinking about uh, reducing um, thinking about public forms of consumption um, because that also lessens the kinds of pressures for uh, extraction in other parts of the world. And that's another important piece of the question. Yeah, I think that that slogan. In the 21st century, all climates is, is uh, uh, all politics is climate politics is a is a good slogan to apply to any issue that you're working on. I mean, let's take housing in Seattle, which is we do have an enormous problem in Seattle. Uh, the rents have are escalating, kind of like in San Francisco, way beyond the affordability of anybody who works in the center of the city. So, in the interest of having these luxury condos. Uh, uh, and these kind of luxury apartments being made, the, the people who make the city go, the working class, have to live at a great distance away at an hour and a half, which means they have to commute and drive and so forth, rather than walking to work. So that is an issue of climate politics. And the providing 
green housing for workers in the center of the city is a solution both to the climate change and it's a fight against the speculative, speculative capital which is trying uh, to turn the city, to monetize the city as, as the urban growth machine always does. So, uh, Stephen. Um, I mean, I think different models, the question is about whether models reflect uh, expectations that governments are going to do something. And I think different models, you know, you'll have some projections that are, um, are business as usual, which is if we just continue to emit at the level we are now, and you'll have other projections that are based on um, some kind of expected reduced carbon emissions. And so this is where the 12 years to save the climate kind of thing came from, was that if we were to reduce carbon emissions, I think like 45% or something by uh, in the next 12 years, then we would have a decent chance of staying below 1.5 degrees. Um, and so that's a, a sort of projection of what it would require to get, um, you know, what kinds of action would be required to keep warming to a level that that is um, maybe understood to be safe, although, you know, at the level we're at one degree of warming now and we're already seeing some pretty significant and frightening effects um, and, that, and effects that are worse than scientists had thought they would be uh, even a few years ago. So I think one of the things we argue um, also in the book is this is part of the argument about why we need to be really um, taking very seriously uh, really the sort of 2020s problem and, and taking really um, the strongest possible action in the present um, is because we are very worried about some of the uncertainty uh, about uh, climate projections and, and the um, both, both the fact that we've been seeing more climate effects at lower levels of warming than had been than had been anticipated, but also um, the kinds of that that even with a projection of uh, you know what. You know, if you say, well, it would take X amount of, we'd have to reduce X amount of emissions to keep around 1.5 degrees, that's, a, that's an estimate. So um, there's also a sort of uh, a variability and potential risk of, of more degrees of warming than that, and that comes with even uh, more frightening effects. So I think we, we the, the sort of, I mean, carbon taxes are supposed to work gradually over time, and we don't think we have a gradual uh, time in which to reduce emissions, but especially because that puts us at risk, even if, even if the sort of, um, you know, expected level of warming is 1.5 degrees, there's still, it's still possible that you would get up to two or three degrees, um, because the protections aren't, you know, they're not perfect. We can't anticipate exactly what the degree of warming would be. We don't know what all the feedback loops will be. Um, and so we think it's really, really important to, <laughs> uh, to, to not sort of aim for two degrees and maybe accidentally end up with three. We need to really aim for 1.5 and if we, uh, uh, and, and aim for the most reduction possible. And if we'd rather miss a really aggressive target than sort of <laughs> miss a way less aggressive target with a higher degree of risk. Now the faux new, faux new deal works by nudges, by letting the market solve the problems that the market creates, which is, of course, what Red May opposes. Uh, let's take two more questions. Uh, well, we got a lot of questions, so let's. Why don't take, we? Uh, should we just take the? I mean, since it's, I don't know how long people can say that. We should take a couple at a time. Yeah, let's two take a couple. Three. Let's take Good questions. Okay. Yeah, they're all great questions. Um, so the first one, I guess briefly, there hasn't been additional legislation. Um, there, I mean, so this, this housing bill I was talking about is the only piece of sort of legislation, concrete legislation that's come out so far, um, and it doesn't have anything on that specifically. Um, there have been projects to try to uh, incentivize different kinds of like green, um, usually green tech uh, and sort of greening of industry in the past, and I think that's sort of what the carbon tax is at least supposed to do. Um, and I think has had some, you know, there's been a lot of growth of like solar technology and things like that. And so we do say that we should have some support for that. But we also think that, that just uh, you can't only incentivize the private sector. You also have to have public sector involvement in both um, in research and development, but also in deploying technologies and in uh, uh, sort of building out a lot of the, the kinds of changes we're talking about. So. Um, and there might be more forthcoming um, that's sort of doing a, that's, that's suggesting a sort of incentivizing um, project, but that I think there, there have been a lot of projects to incentivize um, private investment that have gotten us maybe part of the way there, but I don't think we'll, we'll do everything we need them to do. Um, the question on the green leisure, I think, is something we talk about 
a lot because I think it's part of our vision of how to live a good low carbon life. Um, and uh, we talk about low carbon leisure as like the sort of phrase for it. But you know, the vision is that we, um, you know, we talk a lot about work and different kinds of work that are, you know, I think that we talk about different kinds of green jobs that we imagine um, being part of the Green New Deal, but also about working less um, because we, uh, we know we can meet people's needs with less work. We can distribute work more, um, more evenly and then we can all have more time to enjoy our lives and so we talk a lot about what that might look like and part of the um so there's both uh having more leisure time to spend sort of um you know uh in relationships to other people to enjoy um you know culture and arts and things like that um to uh to to have you know we talk about part of the built environment question being how to build out um, spaces of public luxury and recreation that we can, you know, um, again, enjoy forms of low carbon consumption um, in. And I think that's really important, um, both as a vision of a different kind of good life, um, uh, and also, but also as a part of, um, uh, I think what you, you know, sort of suggest around like how to build a sense of way into um, climate politics, which I think are often the, the affect is kind of negative fear, guilt, um, feeling really bad about everything all the time. Um, we need to have something to counter that and a vision that is about, um, about joy and, and, uh, and sort of, um, you know, communal luxury and things that are, that are, that we want. And I'm actually just going to, I want to read this one thing that I found, um, this great, uh, so this is from this, um, in 1912, this um, socialist organizer of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, Pauline Newman, wrote this uh, editorial about uh, what, uh, she was trying to organize a union, and she's sort of writing about um, why they should organize a union, and she says, um, what a glorious time is spring. Despair vanishes, gloom is forgotten. How would you like to run about the recently awakened country rather than sit at the machine? Oh, how you would like to drink in the pure air and be warm by the sunshine. How you would like to roam about in the fields, dreaming and admiring the beauty of nature. Uh, a six hour day in the spring. What a delight it would be to leave the factory, the mill, the department store while the sun is still shining. Um, and this idea that you actually um, want to, that workers want to go out and enjoy this beautiful time of year, but instead they're stuck, um, you know, tied to the machine, working at the time, you know, 10 hours a day, um, and that that could be otherwise. And so I think we take inspiration from that. And then I also think um, there's this great line in Virginia Woolf's A Room of uh, One's Own, where she talks about how with 500 pounds a year, um, you know, pounds as in currency, uh, you can be alive in the sunshine and you can, uh, you can live, that's enough to live on and to enjoy your life out in the sunshine um, and, and that you don't need to sort of be making more and more money for forever, uh, that th there are some sort of things that are part of the good life that aren't that, um, uh, that, that are neither that expensive or that resource intensive and so I think we want to think about what those are. So, Just can I interject one thing here, a great line from Garcia Lorca which you guys should use as part of your thing. He has a poem that begins, verde, verde, como te quiero verde, green, green, how I want you green. It's all about greenness and love and luxury, and it should definitely be in the front of the climate change banner here. That sounds great. Well, Tia, can, that Tia can read it. I'll send her the... Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so the last question on, on climate and capital. I mean, I think our argument in the book is um, that uh, in the in long run, we don't imagine, we don't think that um, a habitable planet is compatible with capitalism, but in the short term, we need to um, figure out what we can do to... Uh, uh, to decarbonize in the without, um, we need to do what we can within the system, and so we think there will be a lot. But we think there will be a lot of resistance from, um, particularly from fossil, from the fossil fuel industry, and from fossil capital. But um, that that's something we we fully anticipate there to be a lot of, I think, backlash, uh, and so it's going to be. I think that's that's one of the, the challenges is how to overcome that very, um, a very powerful industry with a lot, of, um, a lot of money, a lot of power, and a lot of other forms of capital that are backing it. So um, in short, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> the, the process you've described, I think, um, is, is not over uh, and, and confronting, but confronting that power is, um, I think, essential. Yeah, definitely. Um, 
yeah, it's a really, I think it's a really important question. And I think, you know, a lot of, um, you know, I think we'd argue that you need to have um, people need to be able to have, you know, sort of have the, the livelihoods and, and the basic necessities of life um, to have some security around those, to be able to, to not um, have those, I guess, pitted against uh, ecological consciousness or against some kind of environmental program in some way. And so we do think it's important to think about how to build, um, you know, ecological um, or sustainable practices into, you know, those kinds of necessities of life, like work and housing and so on. Um, but I also think, you know, we talk about how we can also try to start building more, um, I think, through those, um, through different kinds of practices and whether it's something like, you know, living, uh, a low carbon leisure or different ways of, uh, you know, spending time and enjoying uh, in time, like whether that's sort of forms of outdoor recreation or something like that. Um, or uh, we talk about ecological care work or thinking about how to um, think about both, both thinking about care work um, for humans, human care work uh, as a form of green job because it's, it's low carbon, it's, you know, meeting people's needs. Um, it's, it's something that improves people's lives without intensifying, uh, resource use, but, but also we should be thinking about ecological care work and what it means to be extending that kind of care to, to non-human nature, to, re, to re, um, restore ecosystems, to, uh, to, to, you know, I think rebuild our, our ecological world uh, in, a, in a more substantial way. And to think of that as a kind of, um, you know, part of the society we're trying to build, but I think it's something that we see as, as kind of happening ways to use the D word again, dialectical way, <laughs> with the sort of like, here are some things, um, you know, that, that doesn't pit that again as a sacrifice that people have to make, um, to that people have to sort of choose an ecological consciousness over their, their you know, kind of basic needs, but that can be built into how people are, um, you know, uh, see those. But I do think that we, we need to be thinking about how that different kinds of consciousness are developed through through these kinds of concrete programs. Um, uh, and I think education is, it's not something we talk about a lot in the book, but, um, but is, is certainly a piece of it. But I think that, you know, that's also something that people are, um, you know, if you feel less threatened by climate change, maybe you can um, think about it in a more, uh, in, in, a, in a way that's not a need to reject it because it, it threatens you in your life. Well, thank you. Uh, now we're going to, line up people who want the book signed over there uh, and uh, we'll also put a little pad with a pencil for people to leave their emails if they want to hear more about Red May events. Let's give Alessa a big hand for the community. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you very much to Joe and everybody at the University Bookstore for making this possible.